Well, I'm looking forward to what God's going to speak this morning because uh, we've stepped into a difficult, difficult and challenging weekend, and I know the enemy is at work. Um, most of you are probably aware of the shooting that took place at Cornerstone Church um, during a worship service for college students. Uh, we had a student there. We had friends there. Um, and we even have a bit of a connection to one of the girls that was killed. Uh, so we certainly want to remember to be praying for the folks uh, connected to that horrible tragedy uh, that reminds us, uh, as we were talking last week, about the brokenness of this world. Uh, I also have sad news in the case that a uh, long-time member, Lynn Bradwell, uh, passed away this weekend. Uh, and uh, Lynn had some severe health issues uh, that uh, were plaguing her and just ramped up, and uh, it didn't take her long uh, to be in the hospital and then turn a corner and uh, I think we lost her last night around 6 or 7 p.m. Uh, and I know Lynn has deep relationships with people in this, in this congregation. And so my prayers are not only uh, for Lynn's family and those who surround her closely, but my prayers are for this entire congregation today, uh, as that is a deep, deep loss. Um, so let's, let's just stop. And, and let's pray. God, we, we come to you with hurting hearts. We come to you with heavy hearts this morning. And as we've been in a time of worship, being drawn closer and closer to you, God, we call upon your promises. We ask that you would fill us up right now because we need your peace. We need your strength. We need your power. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we just pray for those who have lost this weekend. Uh, these stories are tragic, uh, and these losses cut deep. And we confess that in our weakness, uh, this, is, this is difficult. Even though we can give you the glory for what comes next, Lord, we in our flesh, we are hurting. Uh, some of us are scared. Lord, some of us are confused. We just pray that you would make yourself clearly known, clearly seen, and clearly heard this morning. Lord, I pray that there would be a tangible presence for each of us to cling to. Lord, if there are those here today who don't know you, I pray that they would see you clearly. Lord, there are those of us who, who know you, but we need to be awakened to that life that you've set before us. Wake us up, Father. God, we pray that you would strengthen your church, encourage your church, and use your church. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. So, this morning, we're going to continue our, our conversation from last week. And I, I prayed this week that you would be encouraged I prayed for you this week as we talked about some really key pieces to our faith and our life as disciples of Jesus. And we, we, we talked about this exciting truth that if we are active disciples, if we are active in sharing our faith, God grows us and continues to grow us into the people that he's called us to be, the people he created us to be. We begin to grow towards that, but that ingredient 
in our spiritual life, in our relationship with him, in, in our walk, that ingredient of sharing our faith is crucial. It's so important. And, and as disciples, we are called to share our life in Jesus with others. And, and I know there are powerful things that can happen through our actions. And we all love that phrase that's been attributed to St. Francis, that he said, preach the gospel, use words when necessary. Well, a couple of things we don't know for sure. That's more of a tradition. There's nowhere that we can confirm that I know of that St. Francis actually said those words. It was certainly in his character, but we don't know for sure that he said that, but it's always attributed to him. So for tradition's sake, we'll give him credit today. Preach the gospel, use words when necessary. And that's a beautiful sentiment. Beautiful sentiment. But words, words are necessary. Scripture is clear that we are not just to live the gospel, we are to speak it. We're to speak it to one another. We're to remind each other of it. Those of us who know Christ are to be reminded over and over of the gospel. And, and I know I, I've, I've had people tell me, you know, Daryl, you're preaching the gospel. We all know Jesus. Let's, let's do more than the gospel. Well, there's not more than the gospel. It's all the gospel. And we all need to hear it over and over and over. We need to be reminded of it. We need to work it out daily in our lives. That's what Scripture teaches us. And the more we talk about it, the more we share it with one another who know Jesus, the more we become equipped in it to share it with those who don't know Jesus. But if you know Jesus, you have everything you need to start that journey. And, and we're promised that there are those, we call them people of peace, who are out there waiting. The Holy Spirit has already begun to work to open their hearts and open their lives to what we have to say about Jesus, to what we have experienced and engaged in our own walk with Christ. And, and, and we don't have to have eloquent words. Scripture says that. We don't have to have eloquent words. We just have to have the truth to share. I gave my life to Christ. My life changed. And now I follow him. And I'm following him, him into this life right here, the kingdom, right here, right now, building it with him, with his church, right now. And we have a hope for an eternal future together. We can share those words. Everyone in this room can share those words or words like them because there are people that the Holy Spirit has prepared. There are people that the Holy Spirit's already working in because when we share the gospel, it's not our work, it's not our words, it's the Holy Spirit who changes lives. It's the Holy Spirit who draws people to Jesus. That's not our job. Our job is simply to share. And so there are these people who are waiting out there in the world for us. We get to take hope. We get to take the good news to people who desperately need good news in this day and age. We get to be the bearers of the good news. So we're called Invited to share that and to invite others into the story. These people of peace that are waiting for us. And so the challenge last week was, are you praying that God would show you these people of peace? Are you, are you praying that God would reveal to you, would lead you to these people that he has waiting, these divine appointments that are out there, are you asking God to show you those things? So the truth is, the truth is, even though we all know that we're supposed to share the gospel, no one in this room would read scripture and argue with the fact that we're all supposed to be sharing the gospel. Even though we know that, we don't want to do it right? We're scared. See, the sad truth, the sad truth is 95%, research shows 
95% of people who identify themselves as Jesus followers in the church have never led anyone to Christ. 95%. We all know we're supposed to be doing it. But most of us, almost all of us, don't. What would happen? What would happen if that 95% became active in sharing the gospel? Because 5% basically makes up the staff people in the church, the paid employees of the church who've dedicated their life to that vocation. But I'll have to say, we must not be doing a very good job because our job is not to just share with others. Our job is to equip. And we're not equipping. We're not doing it. 95%. And, and do you know that only 2%, it's actually a little less than 2% of people who call themselves Jesus followers and who faithfully attend church, less than 2% nationwide have invited someone to church this year. Did you know that? Less than 2% have actually invited someone to come and engage the power and the purpose of the gospel. People are looking for power. They're looking for purpose right now. They need it desperately. And less than 2% have actually invited someone to come and engage it. we got to change that. We've got to be a part of changing that. And I believe we are. I believe the Holy Spirit is moving, and I believe things are happening here. But we get distracted. We get distracted so easily, don't we? And see, disciples don't focus on the tchotchke things. Disciples focus on the gospel. You heard me say it last week and the week before. Disciples sacrifice everything but the gospel for the gospel. And I, I, love, I love how Life Church puts it in one of their values. And we've used some of this language in, in crafting our new values. And, and Life Church uh, in Oklahoma, they say this this is the fastest growing church in America. They say, We will do anything short of sin to share the gospel with the world. Anything short of sin, to share the gospel with the world. Anything. That means we'll sacrifice. We'll sacrifice what we think a space should look like. We'll sacrifice what we think a, a church should feel like. We'll sacrifice our style of music even. I mean, many of you, many of you have, have made it through the worship wars of Adventure Life Church. Over a decade ago, you made it through. You stuck with it. Do you still have that heart? See, because those of you who stuck with it, what you said is, if we're going to change this for the gospel to reach more people, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. I'm, I'm in. That's what you said 10, 15, 20 years ago. Are you still in that place? Or have you become those who left 10, 20, 15 years ago. Where's our heart in this? What is our why? See, my prayer is that our why, our why is to see others come to Jesus. That that's our why. To see others come to Christ. That is the purpose and why of the church. To bring people to Jesus to grow the church, to grow the church in disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Baptize them and teach them. That's the church. That's who we're called to be. That's our why. Is that your why? If that's your why, then you're not going to listen to distracting things. You're not going to engage in distracting things. You're going to have a heart of sacrifice if that's your why. May not always understand it. May, may not always agree with it. But anything short of sin, anything short of sin to share the gospel with the world. So if, if, we're, not, if we're not debunking salvation, 
then that gives us the freedom. That gives us the freedom to try whatever we want to try, to try whatever we need to try, to try what we feel led to try to bring people to Jesus. And, and we might try some weird things. We might try some things that make a whole lot of sense to you. But I pray and I ask that you would always be engaged in the conversation in such a way that you were all in and focused on the gospel in the midst of changes. We've had lots of changes take place. We have. We have changed more things in a year, a little over a year now. We've changed more things in a year than my 30 years of ministry I've ever seen one church make changes in. We have changed. And that's the one thing when they, they teach you in seminary, whatever you do, don't go to a church and start changing everything. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't do that, right? But this is important. And if we're changing for the gospel, and if the gospel is the most important thing to us to share this life in Christ with others, then we're, we're called to put up with some things. We're called to commit so strongly that we're going to make it through some things that may not be my favorite. Because on the other side of that, God is waiting to show us. He's waiting to join us. On the other side of that, God is up to something powerful. So let's stick with it. Be united as the church. See, that's why Jesus prayed for unity in his big, long prayer that he gave he prayed more than anything else in that prayer that his people would be united. He knew we would have differences. He wasn't saying, I pray that all of my people will agree with each other. That's not what he said. Unity is not agreeing on everything with each other. That's not what unity is. Unity is moving forward, united in the gospel, despite the fact that we don't agree on everything. As long, listen, as long as we're not sacrificing the gospel, everything else is up for grabs. Everything else can go out the door. Everything but the gospel for the gospel. Does that make sense? Because that's who, that's who God's called us to be. And so in this, in this journey, are you praying for people of peace? Are you seeking to share the gospel are you seeking to be the gospel to one another and to others? Are you seeking to be that? Now, this, this person of peace thing, it's real. I challenged some of you last week to pray. I said, pray, I, I challenge you to pray every day that God would show you people of peace. I hope some of you did that, because I think if you did, I know if you did, if you earnestly prayed that, I know God answered that prayer, because his word tells us he will. I mean, this is real. We, we witnessed a few weeks ago, we witnessed God revealing, in a way, a person of peace. One of our younger members, in the middle, I mean, right in the middle of the message, one of our younger members wandered up here. Some of you saw this, not all of you did. One of our younger members wandered up here and found his way into the drum kit. Did you know that? Some of you saw it. I, I didn't see it. I was sharing the gospel, man. But, but, and I usually see these things and acknowledge them and laugh with you about it. But one of our members wandered up here, made his way into the drum kit. I'll tell you what, Scott Engert must have been praying that God would reveal to him his people of peace that Sunday. <laughs> because one of our drummers, Scott Engert, he saw. He saw it happen. And before a drum solo took place... In the middle of the message, a, a powerful message, I might add. In the middle of the message, Scott Engert saw this happen. He, he quietly and softly makes his way up here. Now, this is how I know that young man who was in the drum kit, this is how I know he was a person of peace. Because any other kid, any other young child, when six foot four Scott wanders out of the shadows and lingers over him, right? would have been terrified because even though he was young, he probably knew this isn't a spot I'm supposed to be. 
And Scott walks in, and instead of being terrified, this young man responds to Scott, takes his hand, and they walk out quietly down the stairs, and half the room didn't even notice. See, that's, that's how it worked with the gospel, with our people of peace. They're not scared. They're not startled. They're ready for us. They turn around. There we are. They don't scream. Now, if they scream, they slam the door, they're not your person of peace. So go find another one. Jesus says, shake the dust off your sandals. And here's the great thing. Now, Scott is a saint above saints because Scott did this all by himself, right? But we're not called to begin this journey by ourselves. We don't have to do it by ourselves. Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs. We're called to do this together. We begin this journey together. That doesn't mean that you won't eventually have these opportunities by yourself. You will, but you don't have to. In fact, I encourage you, go in pairs or more. And we've got opportunities like this. We've got opportunities like the, the bicycle ministry. We've got opportunities on Thursday nights to go in a group to go as the church and share. And I guarantee you, people of peace are waiting in those camp settlements. People of peace are there waiting for you to come and share Christ's love with them, to share your story with them. And then you get to be a part of delivering good news to someone who is living in despair. You get to bring something better we all want to be the person that brings something better into the room. I don't want to be the one that brings the dish no one eats at the covered dish. I want to be the one who they licked that pot clean. Like, ah, yeah, they ate mine. I don't know about yours, but they ate mine, right? Now, I'm not saying you should take that posture in your spirituality. <laughs> but I still, I, I get proud about the dish you know, we want to be the one who gets to bring the good news. And so we, we were created that way. We were created to long to step into something good and share it with other people. But see, sin gets in the way. And we see that with our children, don't we? When, when we have to talk to our kids when they're very young about sharing. Everyone's had to have that talk at some point. We talk to our children about sharing. They don't want to share. That's the sin. The sin that they were born with that marks all of us. It's that sin. They, and so we, we have to repent. We have to confess. And there are people out there waiting for us to come and share that with them. People out there waiting to hear pieces of our story as it engages theirs. People out there who just need us to listen without judgment to their story. And somehow engage that with the love and grace and mercy of God. Are we going to do that? Are we going to be disciples? Because there's something the enemy does not want you to know. Not only is that how we grow in our faith. Again, there, there's that, there's that feel, oh, i got to know more before I do that. Oh, I, I got to take a class. Oh, I got, somebody needs to tell me. No. Scripture tells us we have everything we need as a follower of Christ. Day one, you've got the Holy Spirit that will lead you, empower you, and take you beyond yourself in that moment and meet that person where they're already working with your story in that moment. That doesn't mean you have all the answers. In fact, it probably means you don't. You're not going to have all the answers. And so we have this opportunity to be this. But the, the enemy doesn't want you to know, not only do you grow when you share your faith, but you are refreshed when you share your faith. Somebody out there need refreshing? Somebody out there need some revival inside? Somebody out there need to be energized spiritually and physically and emotionally? Somebody out there need that? Because we are promised... When we share the gospel, that happens. When we share what we have 
What God has given us with others, we are refreshed. Take a look at this. Proverbs 11.25. Proverbs 11.25 says this. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. This is a promise from God's word. The enemy doesn't want you to know that. The enemy doesn't want you to know that not only are you going to grow spiritually, but you will be refreshed. Man, I need some refreshment. There are days where I long for refreshment. And I've got to ask myself some hard questions on those days. You see, so many of us are like Philemon. You remember Philemon from last week? Paul writes this letter to him. And praises him for how he takes care of the church, how he engages people of faith. But then Paul reminds him, you got to be active if you want to fully grow. If you want to fully grow, you got to be active in sharing your faith with those who don't know. Paul brings this challenge to him. In the midst of his praise, he kind of insinuates, well, more than insinuates, that there's something missing. You got to be active in sharing. See, we. 95%, when I say we, I'm talking about 95% of the church is not doing this. No wonder our churches are filled with people who are struggling with life. No wonder our churches are filled with people who are burned out, who need refreshment. Because we're not doing this. We're not being refreshed because we're not refreshing others. And and we've kind of got it in our head that it's reversed, but it's not. In order to be refreshed, I've got to share the refreshment I have with others. I've got to start sharing with others. And I will be renewed. I will be refreshed. I will be energized. So there's also the story of a guy named Jonah. Jonah. You guys remember Jonah? Some of you know this story. It's the story of an Israelite. And Jonah is a faithful Israelite. But Jonah loves Israelites. He loves the people of God, God's chosen people. But he doesn't care about the people who aren't Israelites. And God comes to him and says, hey, there's this really big city. It is a city of influence. And and it will have an impact all over the world if you go and share with those people in that city, the city of Nineveh. Problem was, they weren't Israelites. They weren't Jews. God said, go share. Go share with them this, this, this God who created you and loves you. Go share with them who I am. Go share my message with them. You know what Jonah did? He said no. <laughs> and he ran. Jonah ran. Now, that's what a lot of us do. But what we don't realize is that we're missing out when we do that. And again, statistics would say most of us are doing that. We're missing out because Scripture teaches us, Scripture teaches us that this is actually not only energizing, it's fun. Are you missing fun in your life? Because it's fun to share the gospel. It brings about joy. Look with me, Psalm 126, verse 6. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. We might go in weeping. We might go in weeping. But when we come out with the harvest, when when we come out with others with us, we're going to be singing because there is joy. There is joy in that. And C.S. Lewis, I love how he said this. He said, the serious business of heaven is joy. Isn't that great? I just love that phrase. The serious business of heaven is joy. Are you about your father's work? Are you about your father's business? Because the serious business of heaven is joy. Maybe, Maybe you're struggling right now. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe things are really hard right now. And 
You're looking for deeper connection with God. I, I can't tell you how many people over the years, they come to me and they say, Daryl, I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying every day. I am. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying every day. And, and it's, it's just, I, I, I just, I don't feel it. It's just not happening for me. I, I, don't, I don't believe I'm deeply connected to Jesus. I feel like I got to this place and I just stopped. But I read my Bible every day and I pray every day. And I'm even in a small group. I signed up for one of those small groups. And I just, I, 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 there's something that's just not happening for me. But the first question I ask, when, when those folks come to me, and they do, when they come to me, you know what the first question is I ask them? When's the last time you shared your faith? When's the last time you told someone else about Jesus who didn't know him? When's the last time you did that? And most of the time, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever done that. Or maybe they were a part of a mission trip 10 years ago. Well, is that, you know, that mission trip I went on. But it's not, it's not a regular part of their life. And, and I would say, you want to go deeper? You want to grow in your faith? You want to have connection? And you've got to be sharing your faith. What's your plan to share your faith? Because as I said last week, it doesn't just happen. We have to be intentional about it. We have to share our faith intentionally. We have to have some sort of plan. Even if that plan is just, Jesus, show me who it is. Lead me to those people. Lead me to that person today. Show me who needs to hear this, who's waiting, who you've prepared. Show me who that is, and I will go. So I just want to dig a little deeper into last week's conversation. Can we do that? Just dig a little deeper. Last week, we, we basically talked about these principles, what it would look like if God actually answers your prayer, and he will, if you pray it, show me these people of peace. If you pray it, God will answer it. What if he does? What do I do? And we began that conversation with some principles last week. I want to give you three questions to ask yourself this week. Three questions to ask yourself. It's real simple. First question, are you are you changed? Are you changed? Have you experienced transformation? Are you changed? Is there something different about you since you gave your life to Jesus? Because if there isn't, then you need to think about how you're engaging this. You might want to ask for some help in this because you, you have to be changed. God uses changed people to be a part of changing others. It's, it's that simple. If you want to be a part of changing others, then you need to be experiencing change in your own life. I mentioned Jonah. You remember what happened to Jonah when he ran, when he said no? Those of you who know the story, what happened to Jonah? He ended up in the belly of a whale. Belly of a whale. We call it a whale. Scripture calls it a big fish. We don't know what it was specifically. You know, was it a giant mackerel? Was it a whale? I don't know. Was it a blowfish, a giant, a giant goldfish? I don't know. But he wound up in the belly of a big fish. That's not where you want to be. You don't want to be in the belly of a big fish. But he was running, and he needed to change. He needed to change in order to engage what God was calling him to, what God was inviting him into, he needed to change. And so a big fish swallowed him up. Do you know he spent around 72 hours in the belly of a fish? Now, we see the cartoon Jonah, and that's, that's typically this, this room that has ribs for walls. And, you know, he's sitting in the middle, maybe with a little campfire, you know, feeling all alone in the belly of whatever it is that the cartoon is expressing as the fish. And he's sitting there in this big cavity, kind of feeling sorry for himself. That, that's probably not what it looked like. Jonah was being digested, because we know the physiology of a fish. Jonah was being digested. His, his skin was most likely being bleached. He was being physically changed. 
He, he probably had things happen to him that affected him for the rest of his life. And can you imagine the smell? Can you imagine what he had to endure for three days and nights? And, and as, as for the big cavity, even a large fish, he was probably in a very small, cramped, and, and, and dare, dare I say, oozy, and, and nasty and sticky space. You want to talk about claustrophobic. Three whole days and nights. That's where Jonah was. But in the midst of that, he changed. In the midst of that, Jonah changed. He had a new heart. He said, oh God, thank you for calling me to do this. Let me do this. Have mercy and let me do this. You remember what happened? After three days and nights, after a change of heart, the fish spit him on the beach by Nineveh, by the place that God had called him to go. There he was, ready to go, but he had to change. Maybe the struggle you're going through right now, maybe the struggle you're going through right now, God wants to use it to change what's happening in your life, to change your heart, to step towards what he's invited you to step towards so that you'll stop running from being and experiencing, engaging everything he created you to be, experience, and engage, to become more and more like Jesus and less and less of yourself in this world to be the gospel for other people, to get to be the bearer of the best news out there in the midst of a really, really difficult time. In the midst of lives of people who desperately need to hear it. Susan and I, in my first church that I was the senior pastor of, I was actually a seminary student, and they called me to be the pastor of this church and they got special permission because you weren't supposed to do that in our denomination. You weren't supposed to be in seminary and be the senior pastor. But because I'd had some years of experience in Christian school ministry and youth ministry, they made an exception. And, and they let me become the senior pastor of this church while I was in seminary. And what you need to know about this church is they were a great group of people, but they were stuck in a denomination that was very inward focused. But don't think that it was miserable, because it wasn't. That church happened to own a 4,000 square foot Victorian mansion, a 100 year old Victorian mansion. That was our home. That's where we lived. I mean, I, we, we were mid to late 20s. I just started out in pastoral ministry, and we were living in a mansion. I mean, I told Susan, I'm, I'm going to take this call to ministry and, you know, and, and you're supporting me in this, so don't get mad when, when we're living in a shack and we're driving an old rusty pickup truck and we don't have money to pay our bills. Don't get mad at me because that's what it looks like to be a pastor. And the next thing I know, I turn around and we're living in a mansion. Not only were we living in a mansion, in our backyard, there was a swimming pool and a tennis court. Now you think that was something we also had as part of my package at the church, we had a membership to the local country club. I mean, this was ridiculous. You can't write this stuff. <laughs> this was ridiculous. So needless to say, even though this church was very inward focused and the denomination was very in inward focused, needless to say, we were very comfortable there. <laughs> and we made ourselves at home there. But there were two seminary professors out, out of maybe the 20 professors I had, and my professors were incredibly supportive, incredibly encouraging, and, and knew that I had a long way to drive from church and would give me space to sometimes show up late because traffic was bad on the highway because I was living in the parsonage of a house that was three hours from campus. And so I was doing a lot of driving to come, and, and I, most of my professors were very gracious out of the 20 professors I had. Two of them came to me and they said, you, you don't deserve this church. 
You see, this church was kind of one of the crown jewels in the denomination. And I wasn't even through seminary yet. I hadn't earned the right to be there. And they were very angry. And dare I say jealous. Jealous of what we had compared to what they had. Because they didn't have it. And, and they went on a campaign. One of those two professors even started saying some things that weren't true about me. I don't know about you, but when things start to spread to people I care about that aren't true, man, that just exhausts me. That's exhausting to have things said about you that aren't true. And, and I, I, one of the things that I really have strived to, to be in ministry, and I'm not saying I've been perfect in this, but I really have striven to be a man of character, a man of integrity. And these guys were spreading things that brought all of that into question, and they weren't true. And, and then they started spreading things about my wife that weren't true. Now, you wanna pick on me, that's all right. We'll, we'll, I, you know, I might call you on it. I might challenge you about it. You pick on my wife, I'm gonna punch you in the nose. I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. And, and back in those days, this was a long time ago. I've come a long way, y'all. But back in those days, that, man, you pick on my wife, Ed, we, we're, gonna, this is, we, we're gonna go around. Now, I didn't punch my seminary professor in the nose, just so you know. But it was a really difficult time for us because those rumors not only went through our denomination that Susan and I had grown up in, we had relationships that had been for years. Our children were fifth generation in that denomination. And not only were those rumors going around to people we cared about, but those rumors made it to our church. It was gonna affect my job. And it was a really difficult time. But in that process, in that process, our church, our leaders, our elders and our deacons, they stood up for us and they said, we don't believe it. And they challenged those folks. And at different times, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with those, those two seminary professors. And they, they challenged them about what you're doing is wrong. What you're saying is wrong. And you can't do that. And so there, there was a good part of that story. But it was a struggle that we had to endure. On the other side of that struggle that we endured, that we stuck with it, we didn't step away, we didn't run. On the other side of that struggle that was really difficult, that's where God made it clear to us that these people who had loved us so well and the denomination they were a part of was no longer our denomination because it was an inward focused. All of this nastiness revealed to us how inward focused this denomination and, 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 and even our, our beautiful little church was. All of this revealed to us that God was calling us to something more, to lead an outward focused ministry. And that's when I left the denomination and became ordained non-denominational. Now that was a Presbyterian denomination. And I left that denomination. I left friends, I left family. Our kids were fifth generation. I know what it feels like for those of you who've been RCA all your life, and your brothers and sisters and your family are still RCA. I know where you are right now, I've been there. But we left because God made it clear to us, but it took that struggle to change our heart to a more outward focused ministry. We had to go through the belly of the fish to see that God was calling us to lead the church to be more outward focused. And that's when I became a consultant. Now, I hadn't had enough experience. I had just graduated from seminary. But somehow, some way, all of a sudden, I was working for 10,000 member churches as a consultant. And I got to have a voice in what it looks like to be outward focused. We got to have a scope of impact in the gospel like I never imagined. We got to be a part of not hundreds, but thousands of people coming to life in Christ. But we had to go through that struggle. Sometimes we have to endure the struggle to be changed. Is that, is that what God's doing with you right now? Is that where you are right now? Because when God wants to take you to a deeper place, he might have to wake you up to get there. I know that's had to happen to me several times. Maybe God's shaking you right now and saying, wake up, wake up, because there's something really big. And that leads me to the second question. Are you 
going? Are you changed? And are you going? Jesus said, go. And he said, go into all the world. Go into all the world. So Jonah, Jonah's in the belly of that fish. He wakes up. God says, go. You know what Jonah does? He goes. After he wakes up, he spit out on the beach. He goes into Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is so large, it takes three whole days to get all the way through the city. And Jonah goes, and it says, on the first day, he began. He walked for a day into the city, and he began to preach the message God had given him. You know what the message was? You know what the message was? In 40 days, because of your sin, God is going to destroy your city. That was it. (laughs) That was his message. That's not a very hopeful message. That's not a very educated message. I mean, that's just just walking in and you won't talk about hellfire brimstone. There's a hellfire brimstone without the gospel. But that's all he had to say. He went in and said, the creator God is going to destroy your city in 40 days because you're so wicked. And then he walked on. Go tell some more people. He was being faithful. That whole city, we know, because we have the story, that whole city was filled with people of peace. Because you know what they did when they heard that? The Holy Spirit moved them. The Holy Spirit engaged them. And, And they repented. They repented and acknowledged the Creator God. And they changed their ways. And over that three-day period, it was such a powerful movement that it got all the way to the king of Nineveh. And the king of Nineveh was changed. He heard that story. He heard that sermon. In 40 days, I'm going to destroy the city because you're so wicked, because of your sin. And the king made a decree that everyone in the city, everyone in the city would take off their fancy clothes. This was the big city. This was the big city. They would take off their fancy clothes and they would put on sackcloth. And they would take the posture of mourning because of how wicked they had been as they changed their lives, as they all repented and changed their lives. That's what happened. All because Jonah faithfully went in and said, in 40 days, I'm going to destroy it. And you know what God did? Just like God let the fish spit Jonah out when he changed his heart, God did the same thing for Nineveh. He relented. He didn't destroy their city because they repented and acknowledged him as God. Now there's something powerful when we're faithful to go. God is waiting to meet you in the go. And the go might be down the street. The go might be to work. But we're to go. The go might be school. The go might be the playground. The go might be a a park in your neighborhood. The go might be your next door neighbor. The go might be in your own household. But we are to go. We're to be active. Jonah was active. He went. We can't live in a Christian bubble. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, well, I just don't know any non-believers. You know, all my friends are Christians. Well, guess what? Some Christians need Jesus. Some Christians need the Holy Spirit. But if, if, if that is your reality, you're doing something wrong. You're staying. You're not going. And in fact, if you say or think that's your reality, then you're fooling yourself. You go into the lives every day of nonbelievers. And, and you can't live in such a Christian bubble that you're not engaging. God said, go into all the world. To go in all the world. You know, Jesus, Jesus never said all the world would come to church. He never said that. Never said all the world would come to church. But he did tell the church to go to all the world. Amen? Amen. So we've got to do that. We've got to be faithful to go. Are you going? Are you going? And then the third question, final question today, is this urgent? The answer to that is yes. Is it urgent to you? What is urgent in your life? 
Because that's what you're going to spend the most time on. That's what you're going to focus your time and energy on. Is the gospel urgent for you and for me? If there's no gospel urgency in your life, then I have to wonder, have you really engaged life in Christ? Do you really understand what it is you've gotten yourself into as a church member? It has to be urgent. This good news for a broken world, this good news for a broken world, by definition, is urgent. They need it desperately. And we have to take it to them. Are you taking this seriously? And is this urgent to you? Let me tell you something. We are reminded every day, every day how urgent this is. Every day. All of these mass shootings in in a in a two week period. If we look at the last two months, if we look at this year alone, there's an urgency for hope. There's an urgency for life. And we, we, we get to carry that. We get to bring that to others. Is it urgent for you? It was urgent for Jonah. Jonah cried out in the fish, Oh God, let me do this. And he took that same urgency. And he cried out to Nineveh. He cried out, 40 days and God's going to destroy it. It says he cried that out. He was crying out. Are you crying out with your life to others? Are you sharing with urgency? Or have you decided the people around you don't want to hear it? Don't deserve to hear it? See, that's not our call. God didn't say, share this with somebody, share this with a few, or, you know, you don't have to share it. God said, go into all the world. We're called to share it everywhere we go. Everyone we encounter in some way. And then there are those people. There are those people waiting. Your people of peace are waiting for you to cry out. To be urgent with the gospel. Don't make a decision for someone else. That's not your call. That's not my call. That's up to God. Stop making decisions for others. Stop being, if you're in that 95%, Stop being in that 95%. Let's change that. Let's be a part of changing the fact that 95% of the church at large has never led anyone to Christ, never been a part of that conversation. Let's change that. And let's start right here. Let's start right here in our congregation. Let's start right here in our city. Let's start right here and be the change. Let's be the ones who lead the charge. We get to do that. I'm going to call the praise team back up. And as they come back up, I just want you to pray with me. Let's pray together. God, we need you desperately. We need you to change us. We confess we are sinners and we need to repent Help us to do that. Guide us in that. Strengthen us in that. And help us to grow towards you through sharing our engagement with life with others. God, help us to change. Help us to go. And help urgency spring up and out of our lives. An urgency for the gospel. In the powerful name of Jesus we pray.